2023 Nissan Pathfinder 7 seat SUV just been launched. The company, of course, claiming that this one is the resurrection and the life, capable of undoing the dog like deficiencies of its predecessor. The press in full on Nissan appeasement mode, hoping those reviews do their small bit to keep those rivers of advertising gold flooding in. And here are you, cash in hand, on the counter, ready to drop the big bucks. I'd suggest press pause, dude, and just have a think about the issues I'm going to raise. I'm Tony Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Australia only, though. Sorry about that, international dude. Website. Card. Now, very confronting for me to say this out loud, but I've been doing this for more than three decades. And for most of that time, I've been concentrating on mainstream cars that ordinary dudes and dudettes in uh, Australia actually buy. Not the 911s and GT3s and, you know, things of M5s that you tip into turn one at 250 even though that is quite entertaining from time to time, but I've tried to concentrate on mainstream metal that ordinary people buy. And I listened with interest to Nissan's recent claims about the tacit de-shittification of Pathfinder with this latest iteration, and I thought, why don't I steel man them? Why don't I try and make this case objectively by looking at the new one and putting it in complete context in relation to its competitors and where Nissan is commercially in this country right at the moment and see if the new one is actually a contender for you. And guess what, dude? I tried. I tried as hard as I could. I tried really, really hard and I failed. I failed dismally. And I'll lay out the complete case for you about why the Pathfinder is not a contender in my view. Next. This video is sponsored by Olight. Olight torches make ideal Christmas presents. I've been carrying this one every day for more than a year now. It's been great, reliable, tough, versatile, and of course, brilliant. Olight's Black Friday sale is in full swing right now and concludes on the 29th. I've selected five of my favorite Olights today for your car, home, EDC, and Fat Cave. Links in the description plus a discount code AEJC for 12% off outside the sale. Marauder Mini first. It's dimmable but retina scorching if you max it out at 7,000 lumens. This torch turns night into day working under the house or around a campsite and it turns into a proper searchlight with a range of 600 meters at the flick of a switch. It's a super smart on-off switch which needs 90 degrees of rotation before you can turn the torch on, which prevents accidental activation in a bag. Proprietary USB 2 magnetic coupling to recharge, which is a great system because there are no ports to clog up with mud and other environmental debris. Warrior Mini 2 is my favourite Olight and also my preferred EDC. It's drop tested, waterproof and super bright. There's a side switch for more delicate work and a tactical tail switch if you ever need to whip it out really fast under pressure. The Warrior 3S is essentially the bigger brother, same overall functionality, only brighter and tougher, but still pocket-sized. The full tactical option is the Warrior X3, which is a bit too big for a pocket, but tough and super bright. It's great for security work or search and rescue. A decent size for a duty belt, but it will not weigh you down. Three glass-breaking zirconium beads on the bezel if you ever need to breach a tempered glass window and rescue someone. I certainly hope you don't ever need to do that, but it's kind of nice to have if you do, they all use the same brilliant magnetic recharging system as the Marauder Mini. And finally, the Swivel. This is a sensational work light that fits in a pocket. It's also a torch. The base is magnetic as well as a snap hook if you ever need to hang it in place under the bonnet. It'll stick to the car for changing a wheel at midnight and you will have both hands free. You can keep it charged easily in the car via USB. I've got a swivel in the fat cave and a swivel in the car and a Warrior Mini in my pocket right now. 
That's kind of how I roll, and I am typically very hard to please. So that's got to tell you something. Links in the description. Sale runs until midnight on the 29th, plus that code AEJC for 12% off after that. Big thanks to Olight for being a solid supporter of this channel throughout 2022, helping make reports like this possible. Okay, so this is a report in three parts, okay? And the first part is, is Nissan a viable alternative to other mainstream car makers in 2023? Because if you buy the Pathfinder, you will have Nissan for in-laws, right? You're going to marry the Pathfinder, they're your in-laws. Are they going to be the in-laws from hell? Or are they rock solid? Are they going to stand by you? So I looked at that. And then I looked at the objective set of mainstream competitors. Because what I wanted to do was make the case for the Pathfinder. I wanted to say, well, Pathfinder is better than that one on these grounds and better than that one on these grounds. And therefore, it is a real contender. And that ended badly, I'd have to say. And then I thought the third thing that I want to do is... If you're in the market for this car, you're probably watching endless reviews and reading endless motoring media reports, many of those in Australia. And in my view, the Australian motoring press has failed to hold car maker claims up to objective scrutiny, and their inability to do this is getting worse. And this is because advertising, car maker advertising on car editorial websites is the mother of all bad incentives because car makers are certainly not above threatening to pull their ads in relation to any negative comments, no matter how fact-based they are, no matter how objectively true. So what happens currently is that car makers do launches and they invite their favourite tame journalists who follow these middle management nobodies around in a Carmen Miranda-esque fucking conga line and they just reiterate this middle management nobody verbal vomit without scrutiny. And this adds substance to what are often in my view, bullshit claims. And I'm going to lay that out for you here as well. And they're not going to like it. I'm not going to care. Promise. I don't want a Christmas card from Nissan or any other frigging car maker. And I certainly don't want to drive their product or go on any launches because you don't have to do that to know that this vehicle is still a dog. So let's start with part one, the problem with Nissan. And you have to be a student of automotive history to know what the problem is. It's really GFC-inspired R&D brain death syndrome. Because during the global financial crisis, Nissan had a meltdown at the highest level and just stopped innovating. And they've never really started again. Like, it's a tragedy because they were something and now they're nothing, okay? There's objective data to support this. And what happens, of course, is that if you're a car maker and you stop innovating, for the next few years, your product is still reasonably current, reasonably contemporary. And after that, it just marches off a cliff and so do your sales. And there is objective evidence for this. So I'm going to lay it out. I went back 10 years to 2012, which is 11 years, I know that, but it's 11 data points across a time scale of 10 years. So in 2012 in Australia, Nissan was selling 79,000 vehicles, which is considerable, and they enjoyed a market share of 7.2%, okay? That made them a player. This is 10 years ago. 2017, we're fast-forwarding five years. 79,000 sales had dropped to 57,000, and their market share had dropped from just over 7% to just under 5%. So this is a collapse of roughly a third which is significant, but if you go forward another five years to full year 2021, those 79,000 sales in 2012 had dropped to 41,000 sales in 2021. And this is a collapse of nearly 50%, just under 80 to just over 40,000 sales. Their market share had gone from 7.2% to 3.9%. And this year, We've got 10 months of sales data. I extrapolated that up. They're on track, if that's the right word, for 26,000 sales this year. So 
this is a decade-long phenomenon. It's a sales collapse, a train wreck in slow motion. And you need to care about this because if you're not a student of the industry, you might think that car companies are full of car enthusiasts. They just all love cars. They live and breathe cars. And it's not the case. Generally, at the highest level, in the senior executive management meeting, Almost nobody gives a shit about cars because they're in the money business. They're bean counters or lawyers or lawyers who became bean counters or economists who became paper pushers for a car company, you know. They could be doing the marketing for friggin' fruit and vegetables next week and it wouldn't make any difference to them, you know. Incontinence pads or cars, all the same, right? It's just money and how can we make more of it? And when you've got this train wreck in slow motion, which this absolutely is, what do bean counters do? They go, well, we've got to cut costs. We've got to boost the bottom line by cutting costs. And what do they do? They say, do we really need these big inventories of spare parts on shore? And how can we reduce the cost of warranty and things of this? Do we need to train all those mechanics quite that hard? That sort of stuff, right? They just cut all of that stuff back because this is a way of artificially boosting the bottom line because they can't fix the fundamental problem, which is that the product is shit and people don't buy it anymore as a consequence, right? So I also look for context at what happened to other major Japanese car makers in the same time period. Our Toyota went from 218,000 sales in 2012 to 224,000 sales in 2021. Mitsubishi went from 59,000 sales to 68,000 sales in the same time scale, and Mazda went from 104,000 to 101,000. So this is telling me, this reasonable consistency of other Japanese big players is telling me that Nissan's trajectory is due to Nissan's behaviour. It's not a market-wide thing. This is not the rise of the Chinese incrementally consuming sales from the Japanese. It's not the rise of the South Koreans. In fact, in the same period, Hyundai came back about 20,000 sales, whereas uh, Kia came up about 40,000 sales. So they've kind of inverted their relative positions, but not by enough to impact Nissan. And it's Nissan only, right? It's not the rest of them. So this is a Nissan-specific sales collapse phenomenon, and it impacts you if they are your friggin' in-laws. It just does. And therefore, you need to have a rock-solid objective case for why the Pathfinder is the best vehicle for you if you want to shoulder the burden of this ongoing collapse, more cost-cutting, less support, less availability of spare parts. Ultimately, of course, there is going to have to be a reduction in the dealer network because you can't sustain the same volume of dealers when you've got sales that are really just collapsing. What we're looking at in 2022 is a two-thirds collapse. Nissan has thrown away 50,000 customers in the space of 2012 to 2022, unless there's a miracle in November and December this year. Okay, so that's kind of where this is. And it's a tragedy because they used to be something. They were really good. And now they're not. So is there a case for the Pathfinder that means you can embrace this risk? Incidentally, what it also means, this kind of collapse, is that dealers are multi-franchised and they look at which brands are making them money. And that's where they devote their resources at a dealer level. So if you're you know, a dealer and you've got five brands and one of them's Nissan and you've had it for 10 years and sales have come back, you've lost two thirds of the customers you enjoyed 10 years ago. And this is an ongoing thing. What do you do? You ramp back the size of the showroom, you rank, ramp back the number of sales staff and support staff and all of that kind of thing. Because what else do you do? You, do you just bleed financially for no reason or do you adapt to the new size of the market for Nissan? And I'd suggest that none of these changes is a positive one for you if you jump now. And you really need to acknowledge the truth of that, the objective facts matter, at least on my world. So that's part number one. Part number two is, 
But let's look at the competition, okay? Pathfinder TIL, which is the range topping new Pathfinder, it's 78,000 bucks plus on road costs. It's built in the US, so American build quality. 3.5 litre V6 only. So what this tells me is, despite all of the rhetoric that they drummed out recently about their e-power this and e-power that, they don't really give a shit about the environment because the new one is not available in, as a hybrid. The old one was. They haven't got a hybrid in the new one. That's a bit of a fail in the current context. America loves its petrol V6s and sales in Australia, that's only designed to be incremental. We're getting it from America. If you want to buy one, great. But these things need a huge rev to perform, right? 202 kilowatts sounds fantastic, but it's at 6,400 RPM. Like, come on. 340 newton metres is okay for maximum torque but it's way up here at 4800 rpm like come on families do not drive engines like that very often these engines these old boat anchor v6 petrols are dogs in traffic compared with more technically advanced engines we'll get to that and the fuel consumption is shit it's gotten worse it was 10.1 for the predecessor it's 10.5 now like well done Jesus. So let's compare this to a few different vehicles in the market. And I'm going to start with a diesel Hyundai Palisade Highlander, which is 80 grand, so two grand more. But it's made in South Korea, and vehicles made in South Korea are substantially better in general on a quality point of view compared with vehicles made in America. Because quality doesn't matter in the American market. You know, that's a historic fact. The diesel Highlander has one more seat. You can get it as an eight-seater. It's a 2.2 and 7.3 litres per 100 kilometres. So it's roughly 25% more fuel efficient than the brand new Pathfinder. And although it only makes 147 kilowatts, which is 50 less, and that's substantial, it makes it at 3,800 RPM. And what matters even more is the torque production, which is 440 newton metres from 1750 to 2750. So this thing is making its, its maximum torque where you drive normally, in that rev range where the vehicle is operating. You haven't got to wait for it to kick back three gears and rev its tits off and start charging you the national debt for its drinking problem just to get it to perform in traffic. It feels effortless in traffic. That matters. It really matters. So, Palisade. More accommodation, cheaper to run, better to drive, much better support from Hyundai compared with Nissan, in my estimation. So let's compare it to Sorento GT line plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, the FEV. Now that is $81,000 plus on-road cost, which is $3,000 more. It's made in South Korea, which is better than America. 1.6 litres per 100 on the official fuel test, which is 80% better sort of thing. It's got a 14 kilowatt hour battery on board that makes 67 kilowatts maximum and a 1.6 litre turbo petrol inline four with 132 total system output 199 kilowatts, which is numerically the same as the Pathfinder. But because it's partly electric and partly petrol and turbocharged, it happens at a much more accessible version of the rev range, right? So the performance of Sorento is better for real world driving, which is what families do. This whole high revs, high power thing is only good around a racetrack, which you don't want to be on a racetrack in a Pathfinder. You just don't. That's not the application. So here's the objective assessment of Sorento GT line plug-in hybrid. It's heaps cheaper to run. It's got all those environmental benefits, you know. It's got the benefits of an EV minus the range anxiety because you can just go and drive on the highway endlessly. If you remember to tip fuel into it, you never have to charge it up if you don't want in that situation. But it'll run like an EV between home and the office. So that's very versatile and a lot of people care about that shit currently. So there's that. It's got better real-world performance as well and much better support from Kia compared with 
Nissan because Kia's on a roll commercially. So all of the commercial constraints for Nissan are the exact opposite with Kia because Kia's curve is the opposite shape, right? I looked at the Santa Fe Hybrid as well because it's not a FEV, right? You don't plug it in. It's got a smaller battery. It's $70,000 for the Highlander plus on road costs and that's 8,000 bucks cheaper, right? So there's that. Six litres per hundred on the official fuel test, which is 40% lower than the new Pathfinder. It's got a smaller battery than the Sorento. It's only, you know, bee's dick of a battery, but the total system power is 169 kilowatts. And because it's got electric plus turbo petrol performance, the revs are lower and the real world performance is substantially more refined and better for exactly the same reasons just discussed, okay? And then I thought, well, let's look at something that's not a hybrid. Let's look at a Mazda CX-9 Azami. It's $3,000 cheaper, plus on road costs, 9 litres per hundred, so it's about 12 to 15% better on the juice. It's made in Japan, and Japan is the gold standard for vehicular construction among mainstream vehicles. It's got a 2.5 litre turbocharged inline four, and it makes 170 kilowatts at 5,000 RPM. And now that's probably more than the V6 is making at 5,000 RPM, incidentally, because look, the, the beer garden physics on that is that power equals torque times revs. And the reason it won't work if you just multiply the torque figure by RPM is that you have to do a sort of brainiac mathematics fudge on RPM and convert it to a thing called radians per second, which I'm not going to explain because if you don't get it, you'll never get it. And if you already get it, you get it. Okay. But Power is torque times rev. So the way that a V6 makes its power is by revving its tits off, not by making a lot of torque. And the way these turbocharged fours make their power is by making a lot of torque, not by revving their tits off. Because both of those factors contribute to power. You can do one or both and pump the power. So you can pump the revs, keep the torque the same, get more power at higher revs. Or you can pump the torque and drop the revs and get more power, right? As long as you pump the torque enough. Engine designed for dummies, okay? Now, the Mazda CX-9 makes 420 Newton meters at 2,000 RPM versus 340 at 4,800 for the new Pathfinder with the decade-old V6 petrol engine. So there's that. You know, it's just going to go better in the real world. It's got better real world performance, it's cheaper, and you get better support from Mazda than you do from Nissan. So there's that, dude. Then I looked at Toyota because Toyota is the darling of the market, and people who love their Toyotas, they love their Toyotas, right? Toyota Kluger Grande Hybrid, 76000 bucks plus on road costs. So $2,000 cheaper, plus it's a Toyota, and resale value of Toyotas... You know, come on, dude. It's got roughly half the fuel consumption, 5.6 versus 10.5. It's made in the USA. So line ball on that. It requires 95 Ron unleaded, so you got to tip premium into it, but it's drinking about half the fuel, so you could probably afford that. It'd be cheaper to tip the fuel into a Grande Hybrid Kluger than it would be to keep the fuel up to the new Pathfinder. Total system power from the 2.5 inline 4 in the battery system, 184 kilowatts versus 202. But once again, it'd be at lower revs, which is where you drive your family transport seven-seat SUV shitbox, right? That's, that's their facts, dude. They're called facts, okay? Cheaper, better support, therefore better car. What is the objective case exactly for Pathfinder? Because I'm not getting it. And then I thought outside the box, if you're just a breeder and you want a big breeder bus, what do you buy? The obvious objective answer is a Kia Carnival, okay? Kia Carnival Platinum Diesel, 72 grand plus on-road costs. So 6,000 bucks cheaper than the Pathfinder. Doesn't have all-wheel drive, but... 6.5 litres per hundred, so what's that, about 40% less fuel consumption, made in South Korea, better than America, 
2.2 diesel, it's got two wheel drive, front drive, eight speed auto, 148 kilowatts at 3,800, 440 at 1750 to 2750, everything I said about the other 2.2 diesel pertains here. Better to drive in the real world. So much better for breeders. That thing is so versatile compared with a seven seat SUV. Substantially cheaper, okay? Goes better in the real world, has one more seat, more versatile cabin configuration options and much better support from Kia than the others. So if I'm missing something here, let me know in the comments, dude. But I've looked at these vehicles. I've driven all of them. I haven't driven the new Pathfinder. I haven't driven the Kluger Hybrid, but I've driven every other one of those vehicles, the Sorento, the uh, Santa Fe, the Carnival, whatever, the CX-9. And... There's nothing wrong with them, and on objective facts, <laughs> two for one, they're better. So then I thought, what's being reported about this vehicle, okay? Out there uh, currently, what are the journalists saying? So I was awake at like three o'clock in the morning, as you do the other morning, and I don't know why, maybe the cemetery was calling to me in my dreams saying, not long now. Something like that. It's a bit Edgar Allan Poe, isn't it? A commenter alleged that I was a bit Edgar Allan Poe about that. I actually find it quite amusing that the cemetery is um, beckoning to me I'm closer every day. Everything's a clock, dude. Second law of thermodynamics. So I thought, what can I do to cure this 3 a.m. insomnia? And I thought, I know. I'll read something from Cars Guide. Yes. Cars Guide's very interesting to me because Cars Guide is so bad <laughs> that Rupert sold it, right? Rupert disposed of Cars Guide because it was so commercially good for him, okay? And he sold it to eBay, which... Um, and then Cox Enterprises got involved, those Cox. <laughs> I love that. And that, that was so good for eBay that they fucked it off as well, and they, they fucked it off to the Norwegians who thought it was a good idea for about three days until they put it on the market, and I don't know who owns it. Who owns it now? It's got to be like a 4chan or the lizard people, something like that. That's the ownership trajectory anyway. So, look, if you are a lizard person and you've just started watching my fine channel, please accept my uh, unreserved sympathy as to the recent death of Queen Elizabeth II. Too soon? <laughs> now, Andrew Chesterton, who is actually a very good writer who works for um, cars guide. I rate Chester, he's a good bloke, but he is in this unfortunate position of having to join the Carmen Miranda conga line and just regurgitate whatever these middle management nobodies say from time to time at launches, has written a piece about Nissan's claims in relation to the new Pathfinder. Okay, You can find it online, it's there. I'm in no doubt that Chesty has faithfully uh, reproduced exactly what uh, the product cheese at Nissan Oz had to say. He's a dude named Martin Longayru. And uh, I've never met Mr. Longayru. I've always wanted to interview the, the fourth Earl of Longayru in his you know, castle in Bordeaux. We could skip up and down the hall in our tights or something and discuss the the state of the world, just for complete disambiguation. This is a different Longay Roo. Anyway, Mr. Longay Roo said, according to Chesty, quote, it's still definitely up against the Kluger, the CX-9 and the Palisade, <sighs> but not on objective grounds because they kind of shit all over it, dude. But with the improvements in the look and the more rugged capabilities, hopefully it will also bring some of that market from the diesel four-wheel drive off-roaders. And I've got three points I'd like to make on that, Mr. Longayru. Nobody's saying looking for a bus like this confuses an Everest or a Prado, right? These so-called diesel four-wheel drive off-roaders. Nobody sane confuses them with these softies like the Pathfinder and the CX-9. They're not the same, right? There's no middle ground here because there's only two kinds of big seven-seat bus buyers, right? There's your blue singlet 
piss creakian and all he can fantasize about endlessly is hooking up his acoustically transparent aluminium chitois and taking his lovely wife and their conjoined effluent out there on the road through endless busted ass cattle scrub to the creek where hopefully one or both of them can get taken by a crocodile or beaten to death by a cassowary or gored by a friggin water buffalo or eaten by a great white shark stung by a box jellyfish or jabbed by one of those toxic cone shell thingos in the beaches up there or stand on a stonefish or get stung by a blue ringed octopus or bitten by a death adder or a brown snake or you know that is that not half of the tourist attractions for australia i should be the minister anyway that's one category of buyer is it not and then there's another category of buyer who buys the softy and what they do is they go to a nice accessible national park one day living life on the edge and they drive as far as 400 meters off the bitumen on a perfectly graded piece of gravel and they camp in between tour buses and other people in there smelly people admittedly in their subaru xvs and things of that nature and they all think they're having a big adventure in the bush there's no middle ground there's no one who just does something and there's only this extreme or that extreme, it's not a scale is what I'm saying. It's only this soft adventuring and then there's the hardcore piss creaky and nothing in between, daylight in between, black hole in between. You never go back sort of thing. Right, so the second point is that Pathfinder is objectively outclassed by every mainstream competitor. Like, make the case for me that it's not. If you can see some respect where it shits all over the rest, then you let me know in the comments, dude. But don't start with, I oh, reckon I've had 15 Nissans. Don't start with that. Start with the fucking facts. Let's live in a world based on facts. Make the case why it's better. I double dead dingoes, donger, dare ya. Point number three, these alleged more rugged capabilities of this new Pathfinder. Now, it looks better. It's got a nine-speed auto now instead of that shitful CVT. But what are these exact more rugged capabilities? I know it's got a knob on the console where you can cheekily engage it in mud and ruts or something, but... What are these rugged capabilities? Because I had a look at this car. I drilled right down into the specs, dude. Still got a space saver. It's got exactly the same old tragic V6 engine that's decades old with exactly the same outputs. They didn't even give it a cheeky little Joan Rivers and give it a two more kilowatts or one more Newton meter. They didn't do that. It's the same, it's exactly the same. The fuel consumption's actually increased. Well done. Okay, it's got exactly the same towing capacity. It's the same weight, the same size. Like, it's within a bee's dick all around of the same size. It's got exactly the same wheelbase. And what this tells me is that those mother lovers have used as much of the old platform as they possibly can because the wheelbase is exactly the same. I'd like to get under there with a ruler, the old one and the new one, and just measure some stuff because I think there'd be more similarities than differences. Uh, down there, just saying. It's got exactly the same ground clearance. I'm being kind. It's come back from 180 to 179 okay so this is not groundbreaking and i wouldn't class that as being ruggedly capable it's just the same as every other friggin competitor that isn't a carnival right the only difference is they drop it's cosmetically different it's got a new interior i'm sure it's classier okay it, it is classier but they dropped the cvt which was hateful and they put in a nine speed auto and trust me on an engine as outdated as that old shitter as many speeds as you can have is better because it's going to have to jump several speeds from going loping along to overtake that truck. It's going to have to come back four ratios to get the friggin' job done. So Mr. Longay Rue went on at this point when if I had been his advisor, I would have told him to stop. He said, so those that don't go serious off-roading, it's those who 
don't go. They're people. Those who. Those who don't go serious off-roading but just want that little bit more. So maybe from the Prado and those Jeep and Everest type customers. If you're a Prado customer or a Jeep customer or an Everest customer and you're thinking about the Pathfinder and you've got them lined up like that going, stop smoking crack. What you've got to do is you've got to get objective line ball competitors and compare them. Otherwise, you're selecting a vehicle without knowing the kind of vehicle you need and or want. <sighs> Quote, We were fortunate enough last week to take it on some of the more heavy-duty off-road tracks and it held itself up really well. That Pathfinder is untrafficable on heavy-duty off-road tracks. Like, let's get something that a Prado only just gets up because of articulation and ground clearance traction, things of those natures that uh, really matter to the blue singlet piss creakian, right? Let's find the limit of that and then we'll go and put the new Pathfinder on some of those more heavy-duty off-road tracks and we'll just see how far it gets. My prediction... Not very. Kill something every day would be my advice, just to maintain operational proficiency until the cemetery gets its way. Okay. Now, what has held itself up really well actually mean? What the fuck does that really mean? Does it mean it just shit itself a little bit less than the predecessor and therefore we did our job really well? I'm, I'm really not sure, but it disgusts me, and I'm being quite sincere now, it disgusts me that the press no longer holds the claims of these executives who speak for the company to account, to objective account, because that's the function... <sighs> Mr. Bay. That's the function of the press. And that means if we had a functional press, then car makers would care about what they actually said and the bullshit quotient would come down. And I'm not having a shot at Mr Longgate Rue at all, actually. He's just speaking for the company. I'm sure they have endless meetings and they decide what is on message for particular vehicles. And it seems to me that he is particularly on message. I just disagree with those claims. I don't see that they stack up. And if you do, I'd really like to hear in the comments below. Anyway... There's a lot of noise in the market right now about the new Pathfinder and it might be motivating you to get that cash out and extend it in the general direction of the dealer. And if you want to do that, dude, fine by me. Like, it's a free country. But you should at least hear the objective argument to the contrary and then surely decide for yourself.